Hi, my name is Paul Faith. I've been a photographer for uh, around 40 years covering the, the conflict here, the troubles and uh, the peace process. My name is Amanda Ferguson and I'm a freelance Northern Ireland correspondent and Ireland stringer and I'm here today in historic Royal Palace's Hillsborough Castle. Paul, talk to me a little bit about why you wanted to be a journalist. Well, uh, I grew up in Ballymena and uh, I worked for the local paper. Uh, I was drawn to the troubles and the conflict when I was at home at night. I would have been doing check presentations and uh, school openings and stuff like that there, but it, I wasn't cut out for it. I was cut out for something different. Um, and home at night, look at the TV, watch the troubles unfolding in Belfast, uh, you know, the mayhem that was going on. I was drawn to it and that was my calling. I felt that I needed to be there and cover it. And you started out whenever you were 17 and you've been a journalist now for 40 years. You've uh, seen every twist and turn of the, the history of this place. Uh, what was your sort of daily bread and butter activity uh, pre-1998, pre-Good Friday Agreement? What was the sort of events that you would have been covering? Well, at that particular time, I would, would be described as a hard news photographer. I've been working for uh, Pacemaker Press International. You know, at times it was so busy, uh, stories were merging into each other and you didn't know what funeral you were going to, who had been killed or whatever. And it was some, it was, it was awful times at that particular time. And you were, <clears throat> excuse me, and you were in the thick of it, you know, up front eyeballing people in difficult situations, but you learned to cut your craft pretty quickly in those days. If you made a mistake one day, you would learned from that and it would have popped up again, you know, another scenario. And as we were approaching the, the ceasefires and we were approaching the, the Good Friday Agreement, what was the sort of mood at the time? You know, I, I was 18 uh, the year the Good Friday Agreement was signed and I was heading off to university, but you would have been a, a young man in your early 30s with a young family. What, what was life like for you at that time? Well, it was, it, it was strange because, you know, I was enjoying covering the conflict as a news photographer. But we knew there was talks going on and we knew that, uh, you know, the government had been talking to uh, Sinn Féin and the IRA uh, and the possibility of a peace deal coming up, you know, the Good Friday Agreement. It was a young, we had a young family then, myself and my wife, and it was difficult, um, you know, even to the point when we were, when we had kids, we were, we didn't know how, we knew we wanted to call them, but we were worried about picking a Catholic or a Protestant name. Because I'd been to shootings where sectarian killings happened just because a person's name sounded Catholic or Protestant. There was dilemmas like that. So when the Good Friday Agreement was, was coming up and the talks were going on um, and the referendum, you know, I was sort of worried selfishly. This was my job. You know, I was covering the troubles and if that all went away, what was I going to do? You know, but, you know, we looked at it and, you know, there, there was time for change. And we just couldn't keep going on killing people day in, day out. Uh, and like we, uh, we as a family, we, myself and my wife never voted. We are in a mixed marriage. We sat in the fence. I took the, the opinion because I was working so closely with the politicians. You know, uh, I take pictures, I don't take sides. So if we were going to vote, I was have to vote for some party. But we did both vote for the Good Friday Agreement. We thought that was the way forward. And that's the first time you voted? That was the first time we voted. It, it did feel at the time that, uh, and it was cliche to say now, but that there was something momentous was, was about to happen. And I think that maybe for our generations, people who experienced some of the troubles, uh, some of the conflict, however you choose to describe it, that uh, there was a sort of sense of hope uh, among people at that time. Would that? Yes, you could, you, you could feel, you know, there was a, prior to that, the, there was an air of expectancy about the place. Uh, when the Good Friday Agreement was coming up in the referendum, there was a bit more of a buzz and optimism. And uh, in, in terms of the, the Hills, Hillsborough Castle and, and, and your involvement and your relationship with the castle, um, you've been in the building, you've been outside up ladders with, with your long lens. To talk to us a little bit about all your different experiences about being at the castle or outside the castle. Well, sometimes it feels like a, a second home. You've been here that often and I've been in this room uh, with the great and the good taking pictures. Uh, it's the first time I think I've actually been in here without cameras. Normally we're outside on the wall or peering through the railings. And they used to have two pillar boxes there, two white pillar boxes. And we were covering talks and the uh, process of the weather was bad. We would uh, jump in there and shelter. I think there is a picture about of three or four photographers all huddled in there in bad weather. If we weren't in there, we would have found up the wall on ladders uh, to look over to look at the door because people would drive in very quickly and you wouldn't get that shot of them either getting out or leaving. Uh, but the, the bonus is uh, Hillsborough uh, Castle came with a pub, the ply across the way, which was our office. And we could sit over there if the weather got bad and have a cup of tea. And we could sit upstairs. The ply were very good to the journalists throughout the years. And you could look straight out and you'd see if something was happening. 
And usually, sod's law, you'd been here all day for hours or days. As soon as you ordered a meal in the evening, something would happen. <laughs> you'd have to leave it. Yeah, that's, that's the way that it usually goes. Um, so in terms of the political figures that would have been uh, on the other side of your camera, who were you taking pictures of and, um, and what were your memories from that time? Well, for uh, all the, uh, the, the politicians, the, the main players, uh, Jerry Adams, you know, Mark McGuinness, Paisley, Trimble. Like when talks were going on here, like we were queued in, we wanted to get Trimble and Adams in the same frame. Adams would have been happy enough with that. Trimble was a no-no and he would have, he avoided us like the plague or getting in a, like a two shot. You know, and at one particular point outside, I can remember in the courtyard, David Trimble was outside walking about and talking on the phone and Jerry Adams was in the background and he was walking about talking on the phone. <laughs> you know, he knew what was going on and Trimble spotted us and worked out what was happening and was immediately away. Okay, and then the the, the castle has been the, the scene for all of these sort of intense uh, political uh, negotiations. Whenever you're taking pictures of people that are involved in that type of serious business, uh, how responsive are they to, to photographers being around and being there to capture all that? Some of them play ball, uh, Sinn Féin, the SDLP, and that there play ball. DUP didn't normally, they would have come out and spoke to you and that, that, that would have been it. You know, and in this, actually in this particular room, I remember being in here when there was, uh, talks were going to the wire and I was brought in as a pool photographer to take a, a picture of the round table talks and the Prime Minister at that time was uh, Gordon Brown. And literally you get about 10, 15 seconds from that door to here. Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness were sitting here, the rest of the players and the Prime Minister were sitting there. And I literally had to grab the Prime Minister on the shoulder and say, Prime Minister, can you turn around? You know, on the way out, the, the officials went, I can't believe you've done that. I said, we're going to get nothing. So you had to get a shot, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I had to get a picture. And, you know, they, they, once you're in the room, you've got to do it quickly. And they, they knew I would uh, deliver the goods. And uh, at the time of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, where were you when the agreement was pulled together? What were you doing? Well, in my wisdom, uh, I had it booked off. <laughs> So I was away. I think I was away with my wife and the uh, and the kids. We were up around White Park Bay. It was a big picture, but there was bigger pictures to come down the line that I'd been involved in as a process developed and moved on throughout the years. From then, I joined PA a year after the Good Friday, and I was their chief photographer in Ireland. Uh, and the doors just opened, and I got all the big gigs, uh, usually on my own. Like I'd been to Cuba there with. Uh, Jerry Adams, that was a, uh, a big story at the time. I also, when uh, David Trimble and Seamus Mallon went to the States to meet the president, I was there as well. I was in the White House in the Oval Office as they met him, which was great. And obviously, because you've had such a, a long and varied career, you'll have seen uh, different uh, people coming through the doors of Hillsborough Castle for different events, maybe for social occasions, garden parties and so on. Have you seen um, figures and uh, the public's relationship with the castle change over the, over the course of those decades? Well, I think after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, there was a bit more, the security was a bit more relaxed uh, and it wasn't like these big queues you would get outside. Uh, as normal and people were you know quite content and happy to come you know I've covered many a garden party here you know from the Queen Mother you know the Queen you know Prince Charles um, you know all all the royal members as well as uh, President Bush when he arrived here I was here outside photographing at the door you know and it's a nice atmosphere it's a lovely it's a lovely place you know it's nice to have been out there in close contact you know, I did finally get a, an invite to a garden party, uh, but I couldn't go because I was working. <laughs> can, can we talk a little bit about what it's like being on the other side of a camera? Because over the years, you've obviously had to photograph some pretty traumatic stuff. How do you deal with that as a, as a human, as an individual, whether it be a long day waiting at the, the gates of Hillsborough Castle or whether you're photographing um, death and, uh, you know, the worst, um, m most intimate details of people's lives? How do you process that? Well, at times you sort of live off your adrenaline, if it's a breaking story, if it's a bomb explosion, people injured, you know, shooting, bodies lying in the street, um, you're working on a high, uh, but uh, or a difficult situation, you know, a riot where you know, stuff's been thrown at you, you know, from petrol bombs to blast bombs and whatnot, and you need to be on your game. But the camera, it's, it's like watching it on the wee screen. You know, you could be sitting at home on TV, that's the wee TV screen in front of my eye, and that's happening, and, you know, I'm, I'm detached from that. Uh, it's only maybe when you go back home again and you have a look, you watch the, the news in the evening or you're back in the darkroom in the day when you were printing stuff and all, when it was digital, you can see, you know, how difficult and how dangerous those situations were. You know, I've been shot at, I've been 
uh, lifted by loyalists and taken away, you know, have been punched, you know, have been arrested by the police, undercover units, uh, different times in my life, and different stories. So it is is dodgy enough, you know, but I think I've come out the other end okay. And do you think that there's more of an understanding about the, the trauma that journalists can experience and photojournalists can experience? There's a, maybe more an awareness of, of well-being now than there might have been at the start of your career and, and through those uh, sort of conflict years? Some of the stuff we would see and be involved in, you know, I could be in somebody's house maybe two hours after their loved one had been shot dead dealing with the family, you know, and the tears and the crying and the screaming where they would give a picture to be released to the paper. You know, that takes its toll on you, you know, for years. Uh, you know, being in difficult situations, grief at funerals, you know. Um, but one of the things I, you know, I don't know if it's a common denominator, but I noticed that a lot of uh, photographers fly fish. Now, fly fish is a solitary um, game, you know, game fishing. Uh, you go to the river and you're alone, you the solitude, uh, uh, the quiet and the peacefulness uh, is great. And it, maybe that's something, you know, the people who are involved in the conflict and covering the conflict, you know, that's their out and they can go off and relax. It's a solitary uh, uh, sport. Talk to us a little bit about the sort of access that you get as a journalist. Well, you get familiar with, you know, all the politicians and their press officers and, and they know. And sometimes you say, guys, you know, we need to do a picture here. You know, can you can you go out there and you sort of walk towards us or something like that there? Uh, some of them can be a bit more awkward during uh, one of the ongoing uh, talks. Uh, David Trimble was always an issue. Uh, he never really played ball with us. Uh, he always felt uncomfortable around photographers. Uh, and when he would into the talks in the morning up near Castle Buildings, he was always in the car. Uh, it was bulletproof and we had to do car shots, as we call them, so he'd flash in through the window and he was in there. And, you know, it's, it's pretty unnerving, you have half a dozen photographers flashing at you through a screen. One of these days, that happened again. Everybody else acknowledges going in. He didn't. He just got out of the car and walked straight in, back ahead. Um, his press officer at the time, David Kerr, came out and said, guys, Trimble doesn't like this. And I said, David... We have to get him. It's the only way we can get him sitting in the car. I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll not photograph him through the car tomorrow. I says, but he has to acknowledge us. I says, so the next day, um, the car comes up. We were all standing there with our cameras around our necks, just looking at the car, and Trimble was in the back of the car, and you could see him sort of looking up, kicking at us to see what we were doing. So once the car drove in, we got onto our ladders because we have to get on a height to shoot through the fence between the barbed wire and the mesh. Car pulls up at the bottom of the steps. Trimble gets out and he's walking up the steps and we're all going, he's not going to play ball here, he's not doing this. And there was just like a wee shudder with him and he stopped and turned around and looked at the cameras and big smile, <laughs> wave no way, <laughs> job done. You know, so we've a wee bit of influence of, you know, things that we can, uh, you know, they've got to work with us and they, and they did at those, those times. And you'll have had to photograph various secretaries of state over the year and there's been quite a number and they'll have passed through uh, the castle and they'll have passed through uh, your, 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 uh, lens. Is, is, is there anyone in particular that was easier to photograph or you have more of a relationship with than the others? Well, Mo Molan was, was brilliant. She was she was great. She was good crack. She very easy to go on, you know, and she would nearly set the picture up for you. Or if you suggested something, she would have, she would have made it better. Um, I remember being here one day, uh, Peter Mandelson was the uh, uh, Secretary of State then. We were, I can't remember what we were doing, but we were outside and at the far end there was a couple of big sun loungers sitting. It was a beautiful day. And uh, I was like, this is some spot here you have. And he says, oh, it's nice. He says, look, you always stay here the rest of the day. Somebody has gone ahead. Are there any particular images for you that stand out through all of the, the photographs that you've taken over the year that you're most proud of or that you think, you know, wow, that's, that's, that's something to have captured? There's a couple come to mind. Um, you know, the Chuckle Brothers picture, Ian Paisley and Mark McGuinness, where they sat down and uh, shared power in part of the buildings. Like, nobody would have believed you'd have seen the pair of them together. You know, any time you were out with Paisley and years prior to that, it was Breck Sinn Féin. It was never and ever and ever. And there are these two guys are sitting sharing power. And the beauty about that picture was I, there was only a couple of photographers in uh, Parliament Buildings that day. And we were in the First Minister's office prior. And it was uh, Paisley McGuinness, uh, Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern, and the Secretary of State. And the, those three were sitting on the sofa and Paisley and McGuinness were in the two armchairs and they brought in tea and they were talking and laughing. And Blair was talking about going out of politics and Paisley was laughing and saying he was coming into politics, you know, as a first minister. Uh, so once they went out into the main hall and came down to address everybody, Tony Blair was speaking first. And I just knew, I could see the picture happening, that Paisley was going to start laughing. 
so I got myself and it was a very, very tight position. I had my back up against the front row with the knees and sure as Tony Blair started it up, Paisley started it slapping and McGuinness started laughing. And that's an historic picture of the perm that travelled the world and it's in the history books now, you know, how far we've moved forward, you know, in this country. Uh, uh, yet again, what are the other ones? You, they're, they're easy enough pictures to take, to, to be there and actually get them is the handshake with uh, Martin McGuinness and the Queen. That was flagged up for a long time. It was going to happen, it wasn't going to happen. We were going to see it, it was going to be talked about. You know, I was told about two weeks prior that I was going to be involved in this from London. I think it was a safe pair of hands and they knew it would be done and done properly. And it was the night before, I think they had it around with Derek Henderson. He said, uh, he says, I hope you're worried about this. I hope you don't sleep tonight. He says, why? He said, this is huge, Paul. This is huge. He says, I'm halfway down a bottle of wine. I don't know what sort of tie I'm going to wear tomorrow. And he said, uh, he says, look, you, you do, do a good job. I says, it's a handshake, Derek. He says, the amount of handshakes I've done over the years, I can't be that difficult. And I got there the next day and the guys were sweeping. They would have recognised me. And he says, you doing this on your own? He says, I, oof, no pressure on you then. He says, you're not going to second go at this. You know, he says, make sure you've got film on the camera. He says, they're digital now. He says, right, make sure the batteries are in it. Make sure your flash is on. And then I started to get panicked. In fact, I started to check everything I shouldn't have done. And we set a line up beforehand because they'd, they'd come in upstairs. The Queen uh, and Peter Robinson took the lead uh, looking at the, the artwork. And uh, McGuinness was in the background with Prince Philip. Now, I didn't know whether we were going to get a handshake or not, but I knew this was the only room we were in, and I was getting worried, thinking, hang on a second, McGuinness is away in the back here, and he could see me, and I was going to McGuinness, oh, that's right. Come closer, because <laughs> Peter Robinson was with the Queen, and sure enough, Martin moved up in beside the Queen, and they started to talk. And I thought, right, okay, we've got some here definitely. And we went downstairs, and he says, "There's going to be a line up on the way out, because normally the handshake will be at the start, uh, and the handshake's going to happen here." So we set a few of the staff up and we photographed them just to make sure it was right with a royal camera crew uh, and me, and that was it. And we had to work out we don't want to be pushing the shoving here, so we walked through it with the other people. First deputy first and the rest of the entourage arrived down in. The Queen came out round the corner, shook Peter Robinson's hand, straight to Martin. It was the longest handshake I've ever seen. <laughs> to the point I could actually look at the back of the car and make sure I was getting it all right. And it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. And out through the door they went. And I walked up the stairs to send it. It went global as it would do. And uh, Martin McKenna said, how was that? I said, spot on. Do you think there's going to be images uh, of that uh, magnitude in the future for uh, future generations of Northern Ireland or Northern photographers to capture? I think one of the biggest images that will come up next will be the peace walls if they ever come down. And they're still there. I was photographing them uh, the other day as part of a feature. You know, and that's always an indicator that we're not there yet. You know, these walls can come down and there's harmony and the communities are living together. You know, that's an obvious one. It's become a tourist attraction now. That day after the Queen handshake, they were going doing the Route Stormont, they were going on the tour. And I went to the hotel, Stormont Hotel, and it was packed. Everybody having their lunch, big screens up, the Queen the handshake and everybody was going. It's unbelievable. When that happened, I was thinking, I took that. <laughs> <laughs>